Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kastler, ham radio operator KE0OG, with another episode of Ask Dave. Today we're going to review a kit that constitutes a major trip down memory lane. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a company called Amico. This company manufactured kits of various sorts aimed squarely at the novice market that was created by the FCC in the early 1950s. The novices back then had very limited privileges. There was very little activity on VHF and UHF, so novices made the most of their privileges, which were CW only, that's Morse code, on the 80, 40, 15, and 10 meter bands. In addition, novices back then were what they called rock bound. That meant that their frequency had to be crystal controlled. In 1957, the Amico company sold a simple novice transmitter for $17 with tubes but without crystals. By the way, that $17 is worth maybe 10 times that now. The transmitter proved popular and was available in kit form. Recently, some adventurous folks made this kit available again based on the original schematic tubes, parts, and instructions. Before we go into detail, I'll point out that this radio has issues, which I'll discuss during the testing section. Now this kit that I'm telling you about is sold by a company called www.thenewamico.com. The company is in Skokie, Illinois, run by amateur radio operator KY6AA, Costa, who came to the United States from Bulgaria in 1992, and his friend Sabi, KK6KK. According to Costa's website, they found an unassembled Amico AC1T transmitter kit on eBay. Over time, they were able to develop sources for all of the parts. And now the new Amico offers a complete kit to make this 60 or 70 year old radio using new parts. They have sourced quite a few of the parts in Russia where tubes and associated components are still readily available. In kit form, the new radio with shipping costs just shy of $250. Now this is all nice and nostalgic, and I do mean nostalgia. This is not an updated kit with a brand new schematic that sort of emulates the AC-1T. These are new, but still old-fashioned, components. You are building a replica of the original radio. Well, maybe I should say that you are actually building the old radio. There have been no changes to the schematic except to add a modern SO239 connector for an antenna and a modern key jack. Note that the old screw type connectors for the antenna and the weird connector for the key are both included in the kit should you really want to go for maximum nostalgia. Now this is not a powerful radio. It would normally be called QRP. It only puts out a few watts. The radio consists of a power supply using a tube rectifier and a keyed oscillator. There is no amplifier circuit. While this is a wonderful trip down memory lane, please don't expect this transmitter to meet modern FCC requirements. I also want to warn you clearly in advance that this kit involves high voltages. You need to exercise due caution. High voltages can kill. Now, who on earth is the market for a radio like this? Well, it could be somebody like me. My very first novice radio was a Heathkit HW16. Just like the Amico, it had point-to-point -point wiring and discrete components, although it did have a circuit board for the receiver portion of the circuit. It was a very early circuit board, not at all like the ones you see today, but it had tubes and worked fine. Other markets might be hams who would like to know a little bit about what the old equipment was like and spend a little money to create something they can use to find out. Recall that this is only a transmitter. You'll have to use a separate receiver. But that was the norm back in those days. 
All-in-one boxes called transceivers didn't appear until the 1970s. Now, let's go through some of my notes that I took while building and testing this kit. I'll try and get some good photographs of various parts as we go along. I took lots of notes. Now, I mentioned the circuit is a power supply with a rectifier tube, followed by a keyed oscillator with a so-called Pi tuning circuit. The Pi tuning circuit can be thought of as an antenna tuner, but really it's more of an interface between the output tube and the antenna that can handle a wide variation in impedance. It is the versatile Pi tuning circuit that allowed tube transmitters to operate without worrying much about antenna impedance. It was not until the transistor radios came along later that a good impedance match became important. In my kit, everything in the list in the instruction manual was present and accounted for. The chassis itself is nicely formed and painted a sort of hammer tone finish. I would note that the chassis I received is not quite square and rocks a little bit on the table. The instructions appear to be copied from the old Amico instruction manual with a few insertions for modern components. Wiring this radio is very different from attaching through-hole components to a circuit board and is a world away from surface mount components. You have to get down inside the chassis with your fingers. Note that you've also got a hot soldering iron in there too. My hands are extra large and at times it was difficult to get the components down inside the chassis. The wiring type that is being used here is called point-to-point -point wiring. First, make sure that the connections you are making are mechanically secure. In other words, so that they will not fall out while you are soldering it or waiting for something else to solder to the same point. Don't solder anything until all items are connected to a point. You could have several items connected to the point and the instruction manual will tell you not to solder it until that last component is connected. This is a very good reason to make sure you have a good solid mechanical connection before you do any soldering. Now the radio has some decals on the front and top and on the back too. Well. If you're good at constructing model airplanes or other things that have decals, you'll have a lot better luck than I did. From a distance, the decals look okay, but upon closer inspection, we had all sorts of problems. The decals, when they were wet, would warp and just not stick. Even when dry, they would come off, so I wish there were an easier way to label the chassis. But the decals are what were used way back then. In the instructions, there is a figure one showing the wiring underneath the chassis. You will want to pull that figure apart from the instruction manual so you can keep it out in front of you. It is very helpful, but it is not quite complete. For example, it does not show the jumper between pin six and eight of socket X3. Note that some of the parts, like the transformer, come with leads that are too long, so you will have to shorten them. This is one of those cases where it's easy to shorten them, but very hard to lengthen them. So measure twice and cut once. By the way, this wire stripper tool that I use is something I had to have after seeing a colleague using it. If you look at my Amazon page at www.dcastler.com slash Amazon, you'll find that I've got a link to Amazon for it. It's not very expensive. And if you do a lot of building, you'll be very grateful for the tool. Note that I often use stranded wire instead of the very stiff number 14 solid wire that they provided just for ease of installation. I have a spool of the stranded wire which has a high voltage rating that I picked up at a surplus store years ago. Be sure to measure the resistors with your multimeter to be sure you've got the right part. I note in passing that there is supposed to be a 47k ohm resistor 
but the supplied resistor only measured 27 K ohms. C2, which is one of the variable capacitors, does not quite fit. I suspect it's a substitute for the original part, and they had to get one that is slightly bigger. It fits well enough for purpose. Note that C3 does not have a ground lug. C9 is a tiny 22 picofarad capacitor, has a very short lead length, and it's so short that I could barely solder it in. If you can't solder it in, just attach a little piece of hookup wire to one of the ends. Regarding the fuse holder, it's not a standard fuse holder that I'm used to dealing with, and before you put it in, you need to attach a wire to it, because otherwise there's no way to get to the bottom later to solder the proper wire. I had a very hard time getting the fuse to make contact. It took several tries. Now, I point out that when you're halfway through constructing the kit, the power supply has been installed and can be tested. I started out with continuity testing just to make sure that the line cord went all the way through to where it needed to and that there was continuity all the way to the transformer and so on. That's where I discovered the problems with the fuse holder, but I finally got it to work. Note that the on-off switch is a double-pole, double-throw slide switch. Slide switches have not been used in ham radio for a long time. And if you are not familiar with slide switches, it will be easy to wire this wrong. Take a very close look at the slide switch and see how it works. Of the six connections, you will only use two. So after I got the continuity tests to work, I tested the filament voltage, which was fine at 6.3 volts. And then I installed the rectifier tube. The power supply perked right up and showed 350 volts DC. Be very careful with this high voltage. Unlike modern transistor radios, you can't just go touching anything inside here without encountering high voltage. Um, I would suggest you put one hand in a pocket whenever probing this particular point so there's no path to ground through your heart. After this, I went ahead and finished putting in all the parts. The last thing you have to do is wind the coil. Now they tell you to take the three parts of the coil form and glue them together. They even provided the super glue. But as it turned out, my coil form came already assembled. So now I have some spare super glue. I will have to be on the lookout for some reason to use it. The coil winding was hard simply because I had to count turns and the wire wiggles around a bunch. Note this is not a toroid. It is what is called a solenoidal coil. This is how all coils were done back then. I had to take a photograph of the coil and mark the turns off on the printout. I finally got it right. Now a couple comments. The installation of the ground binding post was not covered in the instructions. The supplied 14 gauge solid wire is much too large for the tiny holes in the various connectors. In places where multiple wires come together, if you put in the solid wire, there is no room for additional wires. I think the reason for the solid wire is to help with oscillator stability, and it was a common practice to do so at the time. It still worked fine with my stranded wiring. I point out that it's good that installation hardware was attached to some of the bigger parts so I didn't go searching for little tiny pieces. One of the variable capacitors was already installed in the chassis when I got the kit. I took it out so that I could attach wires to a point that was very hard to get to with the capacitor installed. Now I note that the 120 volt AC line cord is polarized, but the AC wiring inside the radio is completely floating and not connected to ground. No instructions to use the fact that the cord was polarized are included, and given the way the thing is put together, the line cord need not have been polarized. Now, the instructions say that the 40 meter novice band is from 7150 kilohertz to 7200 kilohertz. I'm wondering if this is a holdover from an earlier era. When I was a novice, the band was 7100 kilohertz to 7150 kilohertz. And now it's been broadened 
to 7025 kilohertz all the way up to 7125 kilohertz. The supplied crystal is 3550, which is supposed to double up to 7100 kilohertz. I note in passing that 7100 kilohertz is a relatively unused frequency. I would have preferred a crystal that put it around 7050 kilohertz or maybe 7110 kilohertz. I'll have to see if I have any old crystals. When I did the smoke test by plugging in the line cord and turning it on, the vacuum tubes glowed very nicely, hence a major part of the nostalgia, and the radio came right up. I didn't have it to do any troubleshooting. Now the instructions say to use a 7.5 or 15 watt incandescent light bulb as a dummy load. This certainly was the practice at the time. Note that a light bulb is nowhere near 50 ohms. I used my Heathkit dummy load instead of a lamp. Let's look at the oscilloscope image of the output. The output trace is in blue. The volts RMS into the 50 ohm load is a bit over 12, which gives the total power output as around 3 watts. However, let's take a closer look at the waveform. If you're thinking it looks rather like a distorted sine wave, you're right. In fact, it's quite distorted. So what happens when you have a periodic distorted wave? Well, it means there is some power in the fundamental frequency, shown on the scope as 3.55 megahertz, and then you will have some rather substantial harmonics. Let's take a look at this on the spectrum analyzer. Now with an 80 meter crystal and a 40 meter coil, it should put out most of its power on 40 meters, but it doesn't. Most of the energy is output on 80 meters. Now unlike the oscilloscope output, which shows actual voltages, the spectrum scale is relative. We see that the 40 meter output is only about 24 dB below the 80 meter output. While this does mean that the lion's share of the output goes to 80 meters, there is definitely a harmonic on 40 meters that would be fairly easy to pick out. In fact, there's even a third harmonic at 10.65 kilohertz, well outside the 30 meter handband. I doubt this radio would meet modern FCC requirements. One of these days, I'll try it with a 40 meter crystal or rewind the coil for 80 meters. Someday. In summary, it's an interesting radio, a challenge to build, definitely using 60 year old building techniques and nice tubes that glow in the dark. I suspect you might be able to get a real CW QSO going. Older hams who fondly remember this type of radio will enjoy chatting with you. Newer hams who are used to modern radios may find the CW tone to be too harsh and with a bit of a chirp. But I have to say it's cute and will certainly go on my shelf where you can see it in videos. Am I glad I built it? Well, while I was building it, I was not so glad because it's a difficult build with my big hands. But once I saw it working, I was absolutely delighted. Not that it will be my go-to QRP radio, but memory lane was brightly lit. So there you have it. I'd like to thank my newest patron, Mark Kottner, KO4NDV. If you would like to become a patron, go to www.patreon.com slash KE0OG. And I express my thanks to my 212 patrons. By becoming a patron, you help support channel funds. And it is precisely these funds that I used to buy this kit. It also helps me pay an assistant. And my assistant is very instrumental in helping me post several videos a week. Be sure to check out my column in QST called Ask Dave. Until we next meet, 73.